Welcome FMers from around the world to our second live uh, Facebook Live session. And this time we're going to be talking about crushing the complexities for the academic year 21 civilian developmental education call, everything that supervisors and endorsers need to know. If you have any questions throughout the broadcast, please just leave them in the chat feature of the, of the web page and we will have people on staff to answer questions during that time. What I'm going to go over today, uh, we're going to talk about what is CDE, we're also going to talk about the timeline, and then things that you need to know as a supervisor and endorser to get started, and how you can help your employees craft the best package going forward. And then we'll have some contact information at the end. So what is the CDE purpose? And I talked a little bit about this in our first webcast. But from a supervisor perspective and an endorser perspective, think about how we need to meet the long-term needs of the Air Force, how we need to grow leaders into future positions. Um, and we do that through different leadership training, short-term or long-term. And then uh, on the right hand of the slides, it's really there to help prepare those civilians to take on increased responsibility, help manage the Air Force alongside our military counterparts, and then, of course, be, the way that we do that is to send folks to the right training at the right time in their career. So think about those things as you sit down with your employees and how that might fit into those, that employee's um, future and career and how they might be able to contribute to the Air Force after the civilian developmental education that they go to. So what is the timeline? Again, this is new this year where we shifted the timeline sooner, uh, starting the timeline 60 days sooner than normal, so it is open now. As an endorser, you can go in today and actually do endorsement. So the window opened for the employees to start their packages on 13 January. At that time, both the employee and the endorsers have the, had the availability to start crafting their packages. However, on the 28th of February, the employee window will close and it will only be open to you as the endorser through 13 March. After that, it's going to go through some evaluation uh, reviews, quality control reviews and things like that until we meet the development team in June. Uh, if it goes to an Air Force Selection Board, that will happen in July and then the results are expected to be released sometime in August or September of this year. So what are some important things? Um, I just talked about the timeline, so that's there on your slide. Also, please note that um, your MAGCOM, your COCOM, your organization might have different timelines than located on this slide. So make sure that you do understand what your MAGCOM, COCOM, or organization has in case they have timelines that differ just a little bit uh, from what we're showing here. As I said, my vector is open to you now, so if you have employees that have started crafting their packages, you can go ahead and start crafting your endorsements now as well. Keep in mind that if you've never registered in my vector before, you need to go out and register in my vector because if an employee is creating their application package and they're trying to list you as their supervisor or endorser, they are not going to be able to put your email address and information in unless you have registered. So if you have not done so, please go out and register right away. As an endorser, please note when you log in on the main page, you'll see two applications. One will be for civilian developmental education and one will be for the Civilian Strategic Leader Program. If you have employees applying to both, you as the endorser is going to have to go into both of those applications. So just check both of those uh, menus when you log into my vector to make sure that you don't miss someone's package and miss the deadline. And then I mentioned already in the last bullet there, understand your local process. Some of the big things that are happening this year is they might have local deadlines. Uh, they also might have a timeline in there for a functional review. So make sure that you understand that so you can give that guidance to your employees. So as an endorsing official, how do you get started? First thing, understanding that process, right? So you can um, let your employees understand that timeline as well. And if, you're, if your organization has put out guidance that they do want to have a functional review, make sure you let your employees know that because the employee is going to have to manually input that person's email address so the package can flow through that functional review before it goes to the final endorser. 
And again, that's manual. So if your employee doesn't know that they need to insert a functional review email address, then it's not going to hit that step um, in accordance with your, your local timelines. And then give yourself enough time to craft an endorsement. Um, the timeline creeps up on us sometimes, and so we do want to give enough time and attention to those employees' packages before it goes forward. Next, understand the programs, their eligibility, what types of thing, competencies they're trying to address. And by understanding those things, then you can help guide the employee to the right program at the right time in their career a little bit better. And by looking at those competencies and what each course is targeting, then you can help the employee figure out which courses might be best for them. Next, it's best to meet with the applicant and have a one-on-one -on -one conversation. Some of the things that you'll want to do when you have that one-on-one -on -one conversation with them is understand what their career goals are and their aspirations. Also understand what their career gaps are, and I will talk about that in a little later slide as far as how to identify those career gaps. Also, um, the programs that the employee might be thinking they should be signing up for, do they align with those goals and aspirations, and do they align with those career gaps that they might have? And then if you need to, make some suggestions so you guys can come up with um, a plan together on what the best courses are to apply for this cycle. And then finally, utilize the resources available to you. FM has created a CDE toolkit. We've posted it to our FM Professional Development Hub, and the link is there at the bottom of this slide. Uh, go out there and download that and follow our guidance because we do put some very good pointers in there about how to make the strongest package, how to help craft an endorsement, and things like that that's going to help you as an endorser help your employees uh, create the strongest package. There's also posted out on the Professional Development Hub the My Vector guides, which have screenshots of how to actually go into My Vector and make some of the changes within the tool itself. So as you're going through and you sit in, um, in those steps that I just talked about, we're going to talk about understanding the programs real quick. So I won't go through each item on all of these slides, but I do have the portfolios listed here for you. And they are broken down by basic developmental education, intermediate developmental education, and senior developmental education. And so you'll want to take a look at those programs, their eligibility, the grade levels who can apply for those programs. And then the other thing that's going to be key for you as an endorser is to look at the total quotas in parentheses next to each program. So you can see I'm on the basic developmental education portfolio slide, and the first one there is the civilian associate's degree program. The Air Force has 90 seats for that particular course, and that's Air Force wide, not FM specific. So you can take into account how many seats are there to kind of gauge if that program is more competitive or less competitive. And then that is going to help you also identify how strong does your uh, employees package have to be, what types of things are you going to want to make sure to include in that package, um, and just help them uh, pick the right programs. Now basic developmental education typically hits your GS7. It does some of the programs go all the way up to GS13. So take a look at those grade eligibilities. The next one is the intermediate developmental education portfolio, and this is going to typically target your GS12 or GS13 and equivalent grade out there. Now only the ones listed in red require mobility, so keep that in mind as you talk with your employees about their career goals and thinking through whether or not a short-term, long-term, something that does require mobility, does not require mobility, is, some, is right for them at this time in their career. So let's talk just about Air Command and Staff College for a second. That one may or may not require mobility of your employees. And so the way that's determined is if we can guarantee that the employee can go back to the same base but a different job, then we will not request that the employee sign a mobility agreement. So your places where we have more FM positions like Wright Pat, Tinker Hill, Robbins, here in San Antonio where the career field team is located, those locations have enough FM positions where we would most likely not require a mobility agreement. Some of our smaller installations like Shaw Air Force Base in South Carolina, for example, that's a smaller installation and so it would be harder for us to guarantee that employee go to a new position after school. So in that instance, we would ask the employee to sign a mobility agreement. So think through that as you're talking with your employees and which program is best for them. 
And then the last couple slides, civilian development or senior developmental education. This is going to be for your GS 14 and 15 equivalents. And just as I talked about Air Command and Staff College, Air War College is the same as far as the mobility requirements and whether or not we would have somebody sign a mobility agreement or not. So the next thing, and I mentioned at the very beginning, there's two application menus on my vector itself. The second one is Civilian Strategic Leader Program. So you might have employees interested in that particular program. If they are, they're going to have to submit a separate application. And what that program is, is an enterprise-wide leadership development program that is going to pull the individual out of their functional community for a time being uh, and, and let them stretch and grow from a leadership perspective. At the end of that assignment, they will come back to our functional community uh, into back into a financial management job. We have the, the programs broken down into do, two different categories pretty much. One is for deputy director for installation support, and then the other ones are half or air staff joint COCOM assignments. Um, and, and for the, if you go to the next slide, the eligibility considerations for GS-13s, they may apply for the deputy director for installation support positions, but they must do a two-part process. They must apply to a USA Jobs competitive announcement, and they must put in their MyVector application. You can see here what uh, eligibility requirements there are for C-SLIP candidates at the GS-13. They're going to want to see that the person is at least 12 months in their current position at least 12 months as a GS-13 as of 13 March when the application window closes, at least 12 months of supervisory experience, having a bachelor's degree, and then having some installation level experience is really highly desired uh, for those applying from the GS-13 level for promotion into the GS-14 deputy director positions. Now, for the 14s and 15s out there, um, you cannot apply for promotion. Those positions are going to be located at the half, joint staff assignments, and then if you happen to be a 14, you could apply for either a deputy director for installation support position or one of these half staff joint assignments at a COCOM. Again, they're going to be looking at 12 months in current position, 12 months as a 14 or a 15, 12 months supervisory experience, and at least a bachelor's degree to apply for those programs. Some other consideration factors you can see there, um, professional military education is highly encouraged, and then the level or quality of supervisory experience that you've previously held. So moving on from understanding the programs as an endorser, we're going to talk next about when you meet with the applicant um, and what types of things you should be looking at. So the first thing that I want to go over is the what FM values, and this is what we call our wheel. So you can sit down with the employee, go over this wheel, identify gaps with the employee, and try to target courses that can help fi them fill these gaps or even augment their experience. So the first thing you'll want to take a look at is performance. Performance is always our first measure of merit with the employee and talk through with them if they've had some major accomplishments, if they've won any recent awards or decorations for those accomplishments, uh, and things like that you're going to speak to performance in their application process through their endorsement. So this is going to be a big piece of their package. The next thing you want to take a look at is what leadership type roles have they played. And this doesn't necessarily mean supervisory experience. It could mean things where they have volunteered to lead a project for you. Maybe they've done things out in their community at a local church or something like that where they're uh, a voted officer into a private organization. Those types of things can all be included in their package and considered when you're sitting down and talking with them. The next item is experience. And you'll want to take a look at their breadth and depth of experience. So what do we mean by breadth? Breadth is two things. It is breadth of experience from a functional perspective. Have they gotten experience in different areas of financial management? Have they maybe worked in budget and then transitioned over to quality assurance? Maybe even they rotated into accounting for a little while. Also, breadth of experience could mean organizational breadth. So maybe they worked under an air combat command base 
um, for a while, and then they moved over to an air mobility command position, and they're getting similar experience, but from different commands and maybe different perspectives from how they approach things uh, from a different mission set. The other thing is depth of experience, and again, this can be looked at two ways. Depth of experience, meaning how long, how, how many assignments have you held in one functional area of FM, and so I'll use accounting as an example. Have you done different things within accounting multiple times to have a real deep understanding and long experience in accounting to be more of an accounting expert, or have you just had maybe one assignment or worked for one year in accounting? The other area that we look at depth is organizational depth. So has the employee gotten experience maybe at an installation, a comptroller squadron? Have they gotten experience at a ma major command or a combatant command? Have they worked in other services, maybe in the Army or the Navy? Um, or even at the air staff and at the Pentagon? And that's organizational depth. You can also take a look at whether or not they've had assignments uh, on a co combatant command, joint assignments, deployments, things like that can also add to their experience. The next thing you'll want to take a look at is their training. And this can really be broken down into two categories, functional training and leadership training. So have they done things through Defense Acquisition University? Have they went to the professional financial management course or the defense financial management course, those types of things? And then leadership training is gonna typically be your competitive courses where we either bring a class to you or they've previously applied to civilian developmental education and went to some sort of leadership course through that process. Moving on to certifications. Of course, we all have the DOD FM certification, so making sure that they include that stuff on their resume, identify that, um, whether they've completed it or not. Also, acquisition certification, and then have they completed any other test-based certification outside of those two. All of those are things that they could include in their record and that you can take a look at to see if there's any gaps. And then the final item on that wheel is education, and this is broken out into two categories as well. Your traditional uh, education, things like your associate's degree, bachelor's degree, master's degree, and then the other category is professional military education. Have they completed squadron officer school, air command and staff college, and air war college? And so take a look at all of these things with the employee, go over all of this along with their resume to identify gaps, and that might help drive you to which courses will help them fill some of the gaps on their wheel. So next, how do you determine right program at the right time? So we went over the what FM values, start there. Identify those career gaps, um, and then also look at what additional growth, training, education type programs will help augment their experience and other things that they have on their resume. Discuss the programs with the employee and the things that you'll want to look at aside from their career goals is are they able to do a short-term class or are they able to do a long-term class? So maybe sometimes an employee isn't able to go to a 10-month uh, course at Maxwell Air Force Base, but they're able to do a one-week TDY. So talk through that with them on what they are able to uh, support from their work-life balance uh, or being able to even go on a TDY, TDY status for an extended period of time. Are they mobile now or in the future? Because if they're not mobile right now, then the courses that do require mobility are probably not going to be the right fit for them th this cycle. And then take a look at the differences in the courses. So you'll see the courses are broken out into leadership development courses, which are going to be typically one week type classes, professional education, whether it be going in residence full time to get your master's degree or going in residence to like Air Command and Staff College at Maxwell, and then experiential assignments, things like education with industry or legis program, um, those types of things to figure out what might be the best fit for that particular employee. And then you'll want to talk about timing because it's not always the right time to apply for CDE. So think about those work-life balances with that employee. Are they able to contribute and com um, uh, commit to a program right now? Um, where are they in their career? Are they currently a, a Palace Acquire trainee or did they just start a new position within the last couple months? Maybe that's not the right time for them to apply for CDE. 
Um, when did they last go to a developmental opportunity? If they just went last year, maybe it would be better for them to take a break for a year, apply the competencies and the skill sets learned in that course that they went to this last year, and maybe look at next year or the year after to apply so they're not stacking up developmental opportunities right one after the other. And then performance, you know, take a look at performance. Maybe right now there's some things that they have to work on from a performance aspect before it's, they're really ready to um, apply to a civilian developmental education. This really comes down to having those crucial conversations with the employees, making sure it's the right program, the right fit for that employee, and do not endorse weak packages or if it's just not the right time, have that conversation with the employee. But, but I do want to foot stomp. If you're not going to endorse an employee, have the conversation with them as to why, uh, what types of things would make it more competitive for them to apply next time, or what would um, get them endorsed in the future. Don't just tell them, hey, we're not going to endorse you this year. Kind of talk to them, have that, that conversation so they understand why and the types of things they need to do uh, to be more competitive for the courses next time. So I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the lessons learned that the development team saw last year uh, as well. So sometimes when people's packages come forward, the DT does not recommend them further for consideration. And so some of the things that the development team sees when they don't submit them forward for further consideration, their, their, their record of performance, their resume, and their endorsement don't really mesh. It, there, maybe their resume looks great, but the endorsement didn't seem to coincide with everything in the resume, and so there was a mismatch there. Um, maybe there's too many gaps when you look at the what FM values, so their package isn't competitive for further um, pushing it forward further. And then, of course, that endorsement I mentioned, that maybe that endorsement just doesn't articulate that um, this is the right candidate for this particular program. The other thing that the DT will take a look at is they'll take a look at, is this the right program for this employee? So there are times where an employee might apply for something and the DT looks at the record, the endorsement, the timing, and they do make a recommendation to revector that employee to another course. And typically it'll be going from a long-term course to maybe a one-week leadership course first. And that helps the employee round out their resume for a future cycle for one of those more long-term competitive classes. Um, the other thing that happens sometimes is if the employee only asks for one class, if the DT doesn't have another opportunity to push them to a second, uh, second choice or a third choice, then they just don't know where to push that employee to if you as the endorser did not recommend an additional class. So make sure you take a look at that because sometimes there might be one or two courses that are a good fit for the individual and by offering up two different classes as potential options it gives that employee uh, the most opportunity to be selected for one of them. And then of course C-SLIP, um, that one again is a highly competitive program and so sometimes the packages that come forward, the endorsements that come forward just are not the right fit for that program and the development team may revector some that person or may not push them forward to the Air Force selection panel. And then again, the last item, which we talked about a little bit already, is the timing. It really is crucial to make sure that it's the right time in a person's career. And some of the things that happen more frequently than not are the Palace Acquire interns. And so typically we wouldn't want to see an intern apply in their first, maybe even their second year of the program. And that's simply because we have so many functional training requirements that we're asking of that employee that we really want to teach them FM work first and let them apply those skills before we pile on another leadership class onto their rigorous training schedule within the PAC program. So for those folks, you know, if they're in their last year about ready to graduate, that might be the time to take a look and see if maybe a year out um, would be a good opportunity for them to go to one of these classes. The other thing is maybe they just entered a career broadening program or something like that, and so the timing just isn't right for another long-term developmental opportunity. So once you got all that taken care of, looking at the programs, meeting with the employee, the next step is, of course, reviewing the package and crafting your endorsement. So we will go over that next. 
So how do you help build a strong package as an endorsing official? The first thing, utilize that CDE toolkit that I mentioned. Download that from our FM Professional Development Hub. We have examples in there on how to craft a stronger endorsement, how to help the employee craft their career goals in the application package. Those types of things will be in there for you to take a look at. The other thing is help the employee quality check the entire package. Make sure it's competitive, spell check, help them make their resume stronger um, and things like that. All of those types of things are in the toolkit as well as far as giving advice on the type of updates to make in the resume. If the package isn't competitive, send it back to the employee um, for corrections. If it just isn't going to meet the, the level of competitiveness this cycle, then maybe it's not the right time to endorse. Quality check your endorsement as well, right? Write it, walk away, think about it, come back and reread it. Because um, I know I do that a lot of times where I'll write something and I'll come back to it and I'll like, wow, I really made a mistake on that. It doesn't even make sense. So just double check it, walk away, come back, see if it still makes sense. Also, maybe have someone else read it. Um, as well to make sure it reads um, well. I can't emphasize enough the last bullet, stratifications are crucial. The FM development team and the Air Force Selection Board puts a lot of emphasis, a lot of weight when they're scoring packages into your endorsement. And one of the ways that um, a package scores higher is if those endorsements include stratifications. So you will want to take a look at that. If an employee is deserving of a stratification, include those type of wording um, items in the endorsement. It sends a clear message to both the DT and the Air Force Selection Panel that that's the best candidate when you include stratifications. Some do's and don'ts. Um, don't endorse weak packages. So every year for the last three or four years, FM has seen about 250 to 300 or more packages. And each package is reviewed by the development team and the Air Force Selection Board when it get, goes forward. And those panel members are looking at the resume, the actual application itself, the endorsement, and all of that. So if a package is truly not strong enough or it's just not the right time in the employee's uh, career, have that conversation with them so uh, the, the DT is not reviewing packages that just uh, were not strong enough to begin with. There is 2,500 character limitation within the application itself for the endorsement. Don't use all 2,500 characters. Again, it goes back to we're in a board. There's you know up to 300 or more applicants, and so the longer the endorsement is, it takes a little bit longer for the panel members to read through all that. So what you would want to do is um, get to the point, make it clear and concise on your endorsement, you don't have to use all 2,500 characters. On the converse, don't leave that block blank. So, um, or only put a few words in the endorsement block because the DT and the Air Force Selection Panel, of course, reads those. So they do need some information from you as an endorser. So, so don't use things like go for it or great candidate for CDE and leave it at that. Uh, because that's just not telling the board enough about that candidate to know if that's the right person to select for the program they're applying to. What you do want to address are the things listed here. Employee performance, employee potential, return on investment for going to the particular program, why it's the right time, and the right program for this particular employee. And then if you're not endorsing employee for a specific program, one program but another, Make sure you address that in your endorsement so the DT knows why you're revectoring somebody or not endorsing them for one program but endorsing them for another because they can see that in the application itself. And then if it's a long-term course that requires outplacement, you'll also want to identify an ideal follow-on assignment for that individual when they complete that particular training. Do use active voice for versus passive voice. So it'll always sound better if you say this is my best candidate versus this will be or has been my best candidate. Uh, and then it also will shorten your endorsement and make it more clear and concise. So what do some examples look like? Um, so here's where you can see a couple of examples. So the first example up there says highly recommend solid performer that puts service before self. So it's missing a few of the things that I talked about. 
uh, in the recommendation on the previous slide. So you take that and example and you compare it to the next one that says number one of 42 employees in organization absolute strongest analyst ready for supervisory today send to DTLC as final prep course so although that is short that endorsement actually addresses a stratification which speaks to performance it talks about their potential because it says that they are ready for supervisory today and it also says why DTLC is the best course for them right now because it's the final prep course for them to become a supervisor in the future. So those few words talks about performance, potential, return on investment, and why that course is the best course for this individual right now. The next section there has another example. The first one says, I fully endorse Jane, do Jane Doe for Air Command and Staff College. She has excellent experience and produces high quality work. Attendance at this course will enhance her leadership skills tremendously. So that endorsement talks about a couple of those things that I mentioned. It talks about you endorsing the individual, the person has good experience, produces high quality work, um, and that this course will enhance her experience for the future but it really isn't getting to any hard hitting bullets, uh, stratifications, more meat into what um, that person is contributing. It's more flowery words, if you will, and doesn't really tell the DT a whole lot, but it does send a message that maybe this candidate isn't the strongest candidate for that particular course, the way that endorsement is crafted. Whereas if you take the next one, it says, John Doe is hands down my number one of 11 employees, stratification and performance. Selected as the 2019 MAGCOM Resource Advisor of the Year, he streamlined the wing requirements and funding process, identifying unnecessary costs and other mission areas to allow 18 additional flying sorties and the purchase of three additional security vehicles, reducing incident response times by, three, by six minutes. So that talks about performance. They won the award, they were stratified. It gave some results on the things that they've done in their career over the last year. Now the next part of that says, re return on investment is immediate. John is ready now for leadership positions and ELDP is the perfect complement to his education and experience. John served three years in his current position and highly recommend supervisory opportunities following ELDP. So that talks about potential, why this course is gonna help this person in the future, what the return on investment is, and even saying, hey, I think this person is, re is ready for leadership today, and this might be the last course we need to just augment his experience to make him more competitive for future opportunities. So there's a couple examples. Um, that you can take a look at and we have a few more examples in the CDE toolkit that I mentioned as well. Finally, I'm going to wrap up with some points of contact. Um, each of you have a civilian development team advisory committee representative and a development team representative. You as a supervisor and endorsing official um, should know who they are. You can always reach out to them for advice, mentorship, guidance when you're crafting your endorsement. And you'll want to make sure that they know you're submitting these people for um, the CDE call because they are going to be the advocates of your employees when it comes to the actual meeting and the board itself. So each MAGCOM has a representative listed there. Uh, if you're part of a combatant command, right now STRATCOM is the lead for the Civilian DT Advisory Committee and TRANSCOM is the lead for the development team. And then if you work at the air staff, whichever three letter office you fall under, you'll have a representative. If you're part of the air staff um, headquarters, two digits aside from SAF FM, then your representative is listed there for, from SAF AAR. And then if you're part of AFMC, you'll see there that Air Force IMSC, Air Force LCMC, Air Force Sustainment Center do have their own individual center level reps. And then if you fall under any other center not listed there, then you'll roll up under um, the AFMC headquarters representative. And then finally, under Space Command, Space and Missile Center um, also has a representative on the Civilian DT Advisory Committee for the acquisition perspective um, at that level. And then finally, if you need to get in contact with my team, 
please um, don't hesitate to reach out to us. The folks listed under the right hand side there, the force development team, those are the folks that are helping with the civilian developmental education call. They can help answer your questions directly. Or we have our workflow box listed down there and our telephone number. If you have any questions along the way, please do not hesitate to reach out to us. We're happy to help. And good luck to everybody out there across the globe uh, applying to CDE this year.